what is data? What comes to your mind when you hear the word data? So data is just a collection of facts. When you work with numbers such as 23 or 8000 or 3.14, what you're doing is working with data. When you say statements such as this is Sparta, my name is Jim or I love pizza, again, you are working with data. So data can be present in the form of numbers. It can be present in the form of text. And it's not necessary that data is only limited to numbers and text. Data can be also present in the form of images. So as you see over here, we've got an image of a car. And data can also be present in the form of videos. Especially right now, after the boom of internet and social media, most of the data which we have is actually present in the form of images and videos. So if you look at all of these social media sites such as Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Pinterest and so on. So on an everyday basis, you have millions of pictures being uploaded on Instagram. Similarly, on YouTube, you have maybe thousands of videos being uploaded every single day. So what you're doing is generating lots and lots of data every single day. Now, let's actually understand how is the data back then and right now. So when I say data back then, I'd basically mean data around two to three decades back. So data around 20 to 30 years back was extremely small and it was also structured. So when I say data back then was small, I mean that data back then was present in kilobytes, not even megabytes. So if you should have grown up in 80s or 90s, you would have known of a storage device called as floppy disk. And there was a time when the maximum storage capacity of a floppy disk was only 512 kilobytes so you could imagine how scarce data was and also how scarce storage of this data was so you have a storage device where the maximum storage capacity is only 512 kilobytes so data back then was extremely extremely small and data back then was also structured since back then you did not have the internet and social media boom, data was mostly present in one single format and it was structured. So when I say data was structured, it was sort of tabular, it was present in rows and columns and you did not really have any important motive to find out analysis from the data which you had back then. But the data which we have right now because of this exponential increase, we have terabytes, gigabytes of data being generated every single minute, not even every single day. And all of this data is unstructured. So what is unstructured data? Data which is not present in your typical row and column format. So data which you can't really take and directly fit into a table or into a row and column format is known as unstructured data. So all of your image data, all of your video data can be tagged as unstructured data. And when we are sitting on top of this huge amount of data, it becomes extremely important to leverage this data for our help. So as it is stated over here, when we have all of this data, what are we actually doing with this huge amount of data? So we are supposed to utilize this data to answer business questions. So this is where data science comes in. So with the help of data science, we can actually use all of these insights to increase maybe a company's market revenue, or this can also be used to control the spread of a disease. So right now we have this pandemic called as uh, COVID-19 and along with all of the scientists, you also have the data scientists working 
on how to control the spread of this pandemic. So data science has its applications across wide number of domains. So now that this is clear, let's actually look at some of the applications of data science. So consider this scenario where you are sitting in your home in India and you suddenly get a call from your bank asking you to verify if you have actually made a transaction of for 50,000 rupees in Australia for a diamond necklace. But the problem is you've never been out of India, you've never been to Australia and you never spent more than 20,000 on your credit card. So why is the bank calling you and asking you if you've actually made this transaction of $50,000 in Australia for a diamond necklace? So this is a fraudulent transaction and your bank was able to find out that this was a fraudulent transaction and uh, the bank members or the bank staff immediately called you asking you to verify if this was actually done by you. So how did the bank know that this was a fraudulent transaction? So this is where data science again comes in. So your bank would have been using some back end data science algorithms and data science techniques where they go through all of your transactions. And by going through all of your transactions, they would know that in general, you do not spend more than $20,000. The maximum you've ever spent is actually 20,000 rupees and you never spent more than that. And on an average, you normally spend around 5,000 to 6,000 rupees for your credit card transaction. So also you have never used this credit card anywhere outside of India. So suddenly when this data science algorithm sees that there has been a transaction of uh, 50,000 rupees and this transaction has been done in Australia, it immediately tags it as a fraudulent transaction and you get this call to verify if this was actually done by you or not. So this is a very good example of um, data science application. Then we've got this uh, another data science application. So I believe all of you would have a Gmail account. If not Gmail, then any other uh, uh, you know email application, you would have uh, at least an email ID. So consider this. If you have looked at the template of Gmail, you would know that there are different sections. You would have your normal general section where you get all of your mails. Then you have your spam section where all of those spam emails go. Then you have promotions and then you have some other sections. So how does Gmail know whether it's a genuine mail or a spam or a promotion? How does this happen? So again, Gmail is using some data science algorithms and data science techniques at the back end. So what Gmail basically does over here is it does text mining or text analytics. Now, whenever you get a mail, consider these things. So if you look at the subject of the mail, so in most of the spam mails, you would see that the subject will have a lot of exclamation marks or maybe those entire subject would be in caps lock or you could have these terms such as congratulations you won a jackpot or emergency please donate money or important update please do this and also the text of the mail would also contain these sort of terms such as you won a jackpot you won a reward so this, uh, some of the data science techniques have dictionaries and in these dictionaries you have a positive dictionary and a negative dictionary. So the positive dictionary contains all of the words which are not spam and the negative dictionary will contain all of the words which might turn out to be spam. So if the count of those spam words is more than the count of genuine words 
or if the count of spam words exceeds a threshold then that mail is tagged as spam so that is how text mining works so this again is an interesting application of data science